as we celebrate Epiphany, I would like to invite you to join me in a practice and a liturgy that is used in other places around the world to help us not only to celebrate on one day, but also to prepare for the the coming year. There's a short liturgy that is a way that will mark our homes and it's usually done on the front or the main entrance of the home and uh, signs and symbols are used as we ask God to bless those who live, work, or visit in that location in the coming year. And so you'll need to gather some chalk. It could be small chalk or it could be large sidewalk chalk if you have any of that. And you're going to use that as we go through the liturgy together. Chalk, as we know, is a substance that's made of common elements of the earth, and it's used by teachers to instruct students, by children as they play games and create art. We use chalk in this service as an ordinary substance put to holy use. Now, chalk will not permanently um, mar our homes or our doors or the brick around a door, um, but we use it, um, even though it fades over time, we, we use it as a remembrance of God's presence, and then we can do that again the following year as a recommitment and a reminder to all that God does in our lives and in our homes. Traditionally, we remember the names of the Magi as Caspar, Melchor, and Balthazar. And although these names are not found in scripture, uh, as we chalk the home, the first letters of these three names are used. So C, M, and B. They're inscribed on the door frame, again with chalk. Now, some suggest that the C, the M, and the B might also stand for Christus Mansionum Benedictit which means, may Christ bless this dwelling. Now, these letters are inscribed between the numbers of the year of the ceremony or the the liturgy that's being used. And so the people um, who participate in this in different parts of the world, they'll write the, the first two numbers of the year. So for us, as we do this in our homes today, we'll write a 20, and then we will write a plus sign, and then the C, a plus sign, and an M, a plus sign, a B, the plus sign, and then 21 for the year being 2021. The Lord be with you. Peace be to this house and to all who live, work, and visit here. The three wise men came to Bethlehem in search of the Lord. They brought to him precious gifts, gold to honor the newborn king, incense to the true God in human form, and myrrh to anoint his body, which one day would die like our own. Let us pray. O God, you once used a star to show to all the world that Jesus is your Son. May the light of that star that once guided wise men to honor his birth now guide us to recognize him also, to know you by faith, and to see you in the epiphanies of the daily experiences of our lives. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord Jesus, born of Mary, shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. As the wise men once sought your brilliant light, O Lord, so may we seek to live and work in your splendor. O God of light, bless this our home and this our family. May this be a place of peace and health. May each member of this family cultivate the gifts and graces you have bestowed, dedicating our talents and works for the good of all. Make this house a shelter in the storm and a haven of rest for all in need of your warmth and care. And when we go out from this place, may we never lose sight of that epiphany star. As we go about our work, our study, our play, keep us in its light and in your love. Lord Jesus, through your incarnation and birth in true human form, you have made all the earth holy. 
We now ask your blessing upon this simple gift of your creation, chalk. We use it as a tool to teach our children, and they use it as a tool in their play and games. Now, with your blessing, may it become a tool for us to mark the doors of our home with the symbols of your wise servants, who so long ago came to worship and adore you in your first home. Now, you are welcome to pause the service since we're online and you're watching. You can pause and you can go and you can write um, that above the door frame and, and write your blessings around the door. Or um, you're welcome to do that after the service if you would like to continue with the liturgy first. And when you're ready, um, you can begin the liturgy. May we in this house and all who come to visit to work, and to play, remember these things throughout the coming year. May all who come and go here find peace, comfort, joy, hope, love, and salvation, for Christ has come to dwell in this house and in these hearts. May we be Christ's light in the world. Amen. Good morning. I'm Joy Morgan, the pastor at Heflin First United Methodist Church, and we are so glad that you're worshiping with us online this Epiphany Sunday. Um, if there is a way that we can be in prayer for you or support you through our ministries, please contact me on my cell phone. That's 256-393-0809. We also hope that each of you who's watching will continue to support the ministries of the church through your prayers and through your giving. Uh, just a couple of announcements this morning. We are working working on plans to return to in-person Wednesday night ministries and in-person worship. Please be sure to watch your emails and your texts this week as we'll be sending out information as it is decided. Um, again, we're hoping that Wednesday nights will be this Wednesday and we're working on Sundays. Um, now, our tentative plan is for us to be back in person for worship next Sunday, but I do wanna take a moment um, just to, to really encourage you that if you are comfortable worshiping online, we hope that you will do that. We know that numbers continue to rise in our county and all around us. The hospitals are um, very crowded and doctors and nurses are, um, are doing all that they can to care for our family members and our friends. And so we want to give them the opportunity to do that. If you're comfortable worshiping at home, I hope that you will continue to do that. If you um, just have a very strong uh, need to be here and to worship with us in person, I understand that as well. And so we want to make that available to you as quickly as we can. So again, if you'll watch your email and your text um, from, from the church and from one another as we try to pass that along, we will keep you updated this week. And again, we are so glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Good morning, guys. I hope y'all are having a wonderful Sunday morning. I'm going to bring you the feeding of the lambs today. And I've got three friends here that are helping me. Let me see here. You can see this guy, this guy, and then we got one more friend here. And do y'all know who these guys are? Well, if you said the wise men, then you'd be correct. Today is a Sunday called Epiphany. And this is when we celebrate the wise men reaching the manger. And I don't know if y'all know, but Epiphany means revelation or like a aha moment. Like, hey, I've got a great idea. Well, it's called that because this aha moment that these wise men were celebrating was God coming into the world. It was God showing himself to the world through Jesus. So these wise men traveled from afar. When they got there, they realized and they were shown that Jesus was God. It was that aha moment that they had realizing that he was God. And I think they kind of had 
that uh, in mind when, you know, they had their gifts that they were bringing because each gift kind of represents something with royalty, whether it was gold, something valuable, or whether it was a, like an oil that was used to anoint kings. But it was really just, you know, that, like I said, that showing of, of God to the world. So it was that aha moment, that epiphany. So if you want to wow your, your friends or maybe your teachers at school this week, if you have a good idea, say, I've had an epiphany. And then you tell them what your good idea was. But hopefully, you know, maybe that'll help you impress, impress some friends. Anyway, I, thank you for joining me on this little feeding of the lambs, this little journey through and with my friends, the wise men. And hopefully you have a wonderful rest of your day. Join me in a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for each day you give us. Thank you for showing us a little bit of yourself through your son. Thank you for your love. Thank you for these kids. In Jesus' name, amen. This has been an unexpected week for many of us as we have watched on news and um, on social media, all of the events that have unfolded at our nation's capital. And in response to that, I want to invite each of you to join with all of the United Methodists in our conference in North Alabama in 30 days of prayer. The bishop has invited all of us to be in prayer together, and she's shared a special prayer with us that I would like to share with you this morning. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we come before you with heavy hearts. We are grieved by the violence that has occurred in recent days in Washington, Washington DC. Forgive us for any way in which our actions, attitudes, or words have contributed to the divisions, polarization, and distrust that abound in our country. God of the nations, we are grateful for the freedoms we enjoy as Americans. We thank you that though our Capitol building was stormed in an unprecedented way on January 6th, order was restored and Congress was able to complete its work. We pray for the peaceful transition of power in coming days. God of comfort, we pray for the families and friends of persons who died in the chaos. We also lift up to you those who were traumatized and intimidated by what they experienced at our Capitol building. God of peace, we pray that you bring reconciliation and goodwill to every area of life. May your peace prevail in our personal lives, state, nation, and world. Loving God, we give over to you these and other prayers on our hearts, entrusting them to your care. All of these prayers we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I'm going to be sharing with you several different scriptures, and so I want to encourage you to get your Bible and to be prepared to turn. Um, I, I'm going to get to those in just a moment, so I hope you will keep that handy. Now, one day in 1941, Violet Bailey and her fiance Samuel Booth were strolling through the English countryside. They were deeply in love, they were engaged to be married, and a diamond engagement ring was sparkling on Violet's finger, and it was her most treasured possession. Their romantic bliss, though, suddenly ended on this walk as they got into an argument with one another and it escalated. And at its worst point, Violet became so angry that she pulled the diamond engagement ring from her finger. She drew back her arm and she hurled the treasured possession with all of her might into the field. The ring sailed through the air and it fell to the ground and it nestled under the grass in such a way that it was impossible to see. Violet and Samuel, they eventually that same day kissed and made up and then they walked through the field for hours hunting for the lost ring and they never found it. They were married just two months later and they had a child and eventually a grandson and part of their family lore was the story of the lost engagement ring. 
Violet and Samuel grew old together, and in 1993, Samuel died, and 15 years passed, but the ring was not forgotten. One day, Violet's grandson had an idea. Perhaps he could find his grandmother's ring with a metal detector. He bought one, and he went to the field where Violet had hurled her treasured possession 67 years earlier, and he turned on his metal detector, and he began to crisscross the field, waving the detector over the grass. And after only two hours of searching, he found what he was looking for. Later, filled with joy and with pride, he placed the diamond ring in the hand of his astonished grandmother. The treasured possession had come home. Have you ever spent much time searching? Searching for something which you treasure? Perhaps you've never thought of reading the scripture as searching, but John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he later, that later became the Methodist Church and now the United Methodist Church, he called reading the scripture searching. Wesley taught that searching the scripture included hearing, reading, and meditating on God's word. Through this searching of the scripture, we receive God's grace and we experience the presence of his spirit with us. We don't just read about other people long ago who experienced God's presence, but we encounter God right here with us. As we search, God reveals to us who God is and who we are. And this encounter with God day after day begins to shape our souls and our lives. But the idea of searching, it may still seem odd as you think about reading scripture, because after all, it is the Bible, and of course you will read about God. Do you really have to search? And I believe the answer is yes. If we want to encounter God, then we must search. Searching seems to hold an openness to what we will find. And today is the perfect day to begin our own searching as we celebrate the search of the wise men, of the Magi, on this day that we, we use to celebrate Epiphany. Now, Epiphany actually took place this year on Wednesday, the Wednesday before um, today, but we will celebrate today Epiphany. And on Epiphany, we remember that the search resulted in the revelation of the child as the Son of God, the King of Kings, our priest, and our sacrifice. Now, Epiphany means revelation. And if we search, I am certain we will have our own revelation of who Christ is as the Son of God, the light of the world, the Word, our Savior. And so my prayer is that as we read the Bible in this new year, we won't just read, but we will search, and that our search will be with purpose that we might encounter the living God who came as Christ and that in him being revealed to us, we might be changed forever. Now, I think when we're searching for Christ all through our reading of scripture, it changes things. Have you ever read Genesis, starting at the very beginning of scripture, read Genesis, listening for Christ? You've heard John's words to know that Christ was already present in the beginning. John says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, we read this just a couple of weeks ago um, on Christmas Eve. It's, it's traditionally read because it tells us how Jesus is the light and has been since the very beginning. So here are these words from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. 
but to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. John tells us um, that from the very beginning that Christ makes God known to us. He describes for us what this revelation or what this epiphany is that the wise men then later find after Christ's birth. Christ makes God known to us. But Christ has been since the very beginning. Everything was created through him. If Christ has been since the beginning, then how does that change our reading of scripture? How do we hear about Adam and Eve's sin and God's plan of love and forgiveness and grace that would continue to unfold for years to come that leads us finally to God's revelation of his love for us through Christ? I think with, with this in mind, as we search, we find two things that repeat themselves throughout scripture on our own epiphany journey. First, we fail to trust God and his word. And second, God has revealed himself from the beginning, always pointing to Christ. First, we fail to trust God and his word. As we read the Bible, we don't get very far with the beauty and the peace of creation before we find trouble in the garden. Adam and Eve, they didn't need help not trusting God and his word, but they had it anyway. Uh, Satan is there to raise the question we have all heard, did God really say? Now, the serpent was the enemy, and, and, and Satan is why we often say Satan instead of the serpent, because we know that he is our enemy today, and he seeks to introduce doubt into our hearts and our minds about God's word. This doesn't mean that we don't search and bring our questions to God. God is big, and the depths of scripture can be revealed to us in our questions when we are seeking him. But here's the difference. Are you questioning your understanding and seeking to trust God's word as the authority in your life? Or are you questioning God's word and seeking to trust yourself and your authority over God? Very quickly, we see that when we as humans begin to question God's word and have our own authority be over God's word, we will end up changing God's word, coloring it with our own thoughts and preferences, adding things and taking them out. Adam and Eve added to what God originally told Adam. God said not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam told Eve and Eve told the serpent, God said, do not eat it or touch it. When we begin to alter God's word, we aren't trusting and we will end up disobeying God. Adam and Eve moved quickly from the altering of God's word to doubting that God's word could be trusted. When they doubted God's word, they put their trust in themselves instead and made their own decision, disobeying God. Disobedience comes from a heart that doubts we can trust. Do you have any parts of your heart right now that doubt what God can do, that doubt what God says he will do, that doubt God's love, that doubt God's provision, that doubt God's forgiveness, that doubt God's power. And over the next several weeks, as we journey through this epiphany season that leads us toward Lent, we'll be talking about those things in our hearts that can become come between us and our faith and trust in God's ability to do what he says he will do, to love us, to provide for us, to forgive us, 
and to be all powerful in our lives. When we doubt God forgives us, we will choose to keep living as those stuck in sin that think they cannot be forgiven and changed. When we doubt God's provision, we live as those afraid who must control life with a mindset of scarcity. When we doubt God's power, we think life as it is now is what it will always be. And we stop praying and we don't expect God to move and we don't look for healing and hope or change in our lives or in the lives of those around us, whether it be our nation, our community, our church, our family. When we doubt God's love, we begin to doubt the love others have for us. And we are constantly on the defensive. We begin to make our own love conditional and expect the same in return. How can we live a transformed life in Christ if we doubt that we can trust God and his word? Well, we cannot save ourselves from this life of doubt and disobedience, but we can take up the search for Christ. Second, God always reveals himself and always points us to Christ. The, the next scripture reading that I would like for you to read along with me, you can turn to Matthew chapter two, beginning with verse one. And this is where we find the story of God's revelation through Christ to the Magi or the wise men. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from Eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. This news, the news of the new king, it frightened not only Herod, but the scripture tells us all of Jerusalem with him. So that Herod called all of his experts together to gather information on exactly who this child was and what his birth might mean for his empire. And after he had consulted his own experts, he summoned the Magi back for a second conversation, presumably so he could compare the information he had received from his own people to the information being provided by these outsiders. He told the Magi an outright lie. He sent them forth to visit the child with instructions to let him know exactly where the baby was located so that he too could pay homage or worship the newborn king. And so the men continued on their way to Bethlehem, following the star to the exact spot where the baby lay. And Matthew tells us when they entered the house where Jesus and his family were staying, they were overwhelmed with joy and they knelt before him and they presented him with gifts. And after the visit, they left for their own country by another road. And again, we don't know why. We can conclude from the story that they took a different route in order to protect the child from Herod, but Matthew doesn't say that directly. All he says is that they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. And just like Joseph in the story from an earlier chapter in Matthew, they acted on a dream as if it were real. So that's all we really know. These are the hints, the clues, the glimpses into the meaning of the visit of the Magi and the revelation that they received. We don't know how, but it was revealed to them who Jesus is. 
Maybe they knew a bit at the onset of their journey and more was revealed as they were filled with joy. Even amidst Herod's lies and intent to kill the infant king and all the other children, if that is what it took, somehow, even in the presence of the powerful and terrifying Herod, they knew. They knew who Jesus truly was. When we experience the divine presence and the power of Christ personally, it isn't something that we can prove or always tell how we know. But experiencing Christ is revelation to us, and we must be open to God's revelation, even in the most difficult times, by seeking not our own solutions to our problems, but by searching the scripture for his revelation for us. So keep searching that our hearts and, and, and our neighbors and our community and our nation and our world might be transformed by encountering Christ through the scripture and through one another, that we might learn to trust God and his word, that we might live as those to whom it has been revealed, that God is powerful and loving and forgiving, that we might live as those who know through our own epiphany, that even if in these difficult days, God is enough. As you go, 
May God enfold you in tender and lasting love. May Christ be beside you in times of struggle. And may the Spirit guide you to the path whenever you stray, that you may stay in step with Christ and always be searching for his revelation among us. Amen. Amen.